Thank you for joining us for what I'm sure is going to be a very informative session with our friends at the Association of Black Event Professionals. For those of you who haven't joined our live talks before, my name is John. I'm the CEO at Live. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a white male with blue eyes and ever silver, more silver gray hair on top of my head. Um, I've been the CEO at Live for 18 months or so, and we seek to represent the live music industry in the UK in its broadest sense, pulling together a coalition of partners, both to advance our objectives to government and also to look to find ways to ensure that our sector is the most welcoming, diverse, inclusive and best place to work. And Live Talks is part of that programme. And you can see all of our talks archived on the Live Music website, uh, livemusic.biz, um, where you'll find the, the past talks. Um, and we've tackled everything from trans inclusion and sustainability through to mental health and touring and resilience. So uh, I think today's talk fits in very well alongside those topics. Before I hand over to today's hosts, I just want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So please feel free to keep your camera turned off and change your Zoom name to anonymous if that makes you more comfortable. But conversely, if you would like to turn your camera on, it's always great for the speakers to have lots of smiling faces beaming back at them. Um, please do make sure your mic is muted throughout to avoid any background noise. We're hoping to have five or 10 minutes left at the end to take questions. So please feel free to prepare them and maybe pop them in the chat if that's a, a simpler option for you. Um, a recording of today's session will be made available, as I say, on the Live Talks archive on our website, and we will link to that uh, in a second. Okay, that's the, the housekeeping done. So um, Nadu, Plaka, Live Awards 2024 nominee <laughs> and co-founder <laughs> co of the Association of Black Event Professionals. Thank you for pulling together this session. Um, can I hand over to you? Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Morning, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you for joining us. Um, as John said, yes, we are, have been nominated for this year's awards. So if we don't get to speak mm. at the end of this call, I do look forward to connecting with people at the awards themselves. Um, we were asked as the Association of Black Event Professionals to bring a conversation that we felt was quite dear to our heart. Um, that we wanted to be able to expand more. So this is a very short introduction from me as one of our goals within the association is to shine and spread light on members that we work with on a daily basis and people who I believe um, are a massive contribution to the industry. And so today uh, we have Benedicta Asante from Events 101. She is one of our YGs, I believe. Um, who has been making some amazing strides in the industry. And I thought it only made sense for her to take this conversation on and to invite some of our guest speakers today. So it is a very short time and hour and I appreciate everyone coming within their lunch break or time on this lovely Tuesday afternoon. Um, so Benedict, I will hand over to yourself for today's session. Typical me, I'm on mute. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. Again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Benedicta. I'm the founder of Events 101. And I'll just give you a brief overview about who I am and what I do. And then we'll do the same with the rest of the panelists. So um, I actually started within the events industry um, just under 10 years ago. I started my first events business um, at the age of 20. Um, working on smaller conferences and also um, servicing the show through events industry, a world market. And then having taken time out to perfect my craft, I actually went back to university to study business and events management, where I graduated with a first class, which then led me to go do my master's um, at King's College um, London. Um, I've worked with, in the meantime, I've worked with the likes of American Express Global Business Travel, um, I've worked with the likes of Gartner, I've worked with AstraZeneca and other companies um, 
in the events industry. I then founded Events 101, like live during the pandemic, um, as I saw that there was a gap in the market for young people who wanted to come into the industry. Um, there was no real um, funnel for them. Um, and there was no really, there was not really a career path where they could know directly how to get into the industry and how to get jobs. So um, from there, we started working with different events, um, organizers and events companies to provide them a collaboration for a work experience or employment. So we would help some businesses actually do their recruitment processes to ensure that they are diverse and um, are able to recruit people from different backgrounds and not just who you know. Um, so yeah, that is a brief of me. I will pass it over to Juni. Um, please just tell me a little bit about yourself or tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're currently doing, how long you've been in the industry and why. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Benedicta. And thank you for, for even having me on this panel. I, I'm sure people are wondering how I squeeze my way onto here, but a little bit about myself. Um, I am a recent graduate from um, Leeds Beckett University in Leeds, UK. I got my master's there, but taking it further or a little earlier than that. Um, I studied communication for my undergrad. And then, but the entire time I was in my undergrad, I worked in events. So there's always an event planning agency on university campuses. I'm sure many of you have experiences with those. And so I worked through there and found that I loved the events side more than I did public relations, which is what I was studying. And so that's kind of what I geared towards professionally after I graduated. From there, I worked for a small nonprofit organization in Florida, um, essentially planning a monthly music or arts and music festival in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and I did some other work in like higher education, doing their special events for a while before I went back to school uh, in the UK. I'm not gonna lie, a lot of that was for the travel, but also I was very interested in becoming more professionally trained specifically for events. Um, during my time there, I got to do some work. Um, well, I got to write my thesis, um, something that I would like to take further on an ongoing educational journey uh, in, in sort of understanding the lines between white supremacy and how they show up in our, our leisure spaces. Specifically, I was focused on music festivals, um, but in future, I would like to expand across other areas of leisure, leisure and entertainment. Um, currently, I work as an account executive at a marketing um, agency called The Story House. And so I do a lot of experiential marketing, which is just the marketing term for events. <laughs> um, and so you work with a lot of different clients in that way. And I've done some work with AT&T, Amazon Fresh, most recently Icelandair, the airline company. Um, I've, so technically I've been in the events industry for five years, but if you include undergrad experience, that was eight years. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm in the events industry just because one, you kind of get to do the thing where people get off work to go and play, that's your job. So you get to do the most exciting bit for your work professionally. Um, you get to meet a lot of really interesting people, work for a lot of really interesting clients. And so having a standard desk job, I'm sure a lot of people on this call can resonate, wasn't really quite cutting it for me. I needed a little something extra. And so, um, yeah, that that's what kind of got me into the industry. And then as I've grown into it, understanding how I can better serve Black communities is definitely taking more and more shape in my journey. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, <laughs> Sherelle, could Hi, you guys. tell us about yourself, um, what you're currently doing, how long you've been in the industry, and why you're in the industry as well? Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Lovely to see you all. So basically, I've been in the events industry since I was 17. I'm now 30 two tomorrow. Um, so I started working in under under 18 nights in Sheffield and then from there went to Leeds as well, U Leeds University and studied events management. Um, in that time I started working for a lot of different festivals. I worked on the NATO Summit as well and then kind of went traveling and then came back and worked into international events or so doing lots of conferences, exhibitions. I found that really enjoyable. I like the travel aspect, but I realized that it was very white and middle class and I didn't kind of fit in, especially being a northerner in London. So I decided to go into the art space where I worked at the South Bank Centre and did lots of different projects um, like Wow, Shameless, where I was definitely 
more inclined to work with events that help black people or black voices and marginalized communities, but also events that showcase equality, but in a fun and engaging way. Um, and then now at the moment, I'm currently freelancing. So I'm doing a lot of different work, working at Blackfish Book, Book Festival, Kersler events that help like um, voices of prison. So doing events about people in prison and stuff like that. Um, like I said, I've been in the industry for like 13 years now, which is a long time. <laughs> um, and I got into the industry because I come from a council estate and back in the day, my mom used to have the biggest raves and everybody in the community used to come to my mom's house. We used to rip up the carpets, put massive sound systems in. It was like amazing. It was like Bob Marley's music in my mom's house. Like it was like that in events. And I thought, okay, I love it. That's what I want to do. I want to make sure that everyone can be all inclusive. It doesn't matter where you come from. You can have fun and enjoy yourself and let yourself hair loose. So that's why I got into events. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure we can all relate to like somebody, um, you know, hosting parties that kind of sparked our interest. So thank you so much. And lastly, Dr. Pam, please um, share with us who you are, what you do, and how long you've been in the industry for and why. Thanks, Benedicta. Um, I'm Pam Zagoma. I'm uh, currently the academic portfolio lead for events management at the University of Greenwich. Um, I'm also a senior lecturer, so I teach events management subjects, um, basically first year, second year, third year, and master's students. Um, my speciality and interest is arts events, cultural events, uh, third sector events, so charity events. Uh, I'm a big fan of those, and pretty much, uh, and event finance as well, because my sort of journey into my background, my first degree was in accounting, but pretty much what uh, Janine uh, shared, I spent, you know, while working for Ernst & Young, I would spend my weekends uh, organizing festivals, arts festivals. And so I decided to uh, come across to the UK, studied uh, my master's in events management at Leeds Beckett. This is, um, I graduated in 2004. So I'm feeling quite old here. <laughs> So yeah, 20 years ago, got that events management uh, master's and was lucky enough to get work um, uh, in London, working with a dance charity, Dance UK, and um, starting up Association of uh, Dance of the African Diaspora, where I organized a, a, a big uh, sort of exhibition event on the history of Black British dance. Uh, and then from there, doing a, a lot of sort of arts-based events uh, in the dance sector. And after a while, looking at audience development um, and audience engagement. So working with venues um, in the West Midlands, uh, all sorts of venues from uh, music venues um, to, uh, you know, multi-arts. Um, and after, while doing that, and then um, following that, I actually worked uh, with a charity, a social enterprise, I started to sort of query what was going on in terms of, especially with my interest events for good and how were we designing them, which led me to do my uh, PhD, uh, where I looked at how we could decolonize event design. So with that, I focused on visual arts, the organization of uh, visual arts events, uh, such as art exhibitions. So I did that. Um, and whilst doing that, they got into academia and have been teaching uh, at, at University of Greenwich since 2015. Prior to that, I was at University of Northampton. So, uh, yeah, now I'm full time academic, but still attending events and getting involved in events in my free time. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for the experience which you have, because I think you bring a different um, aspect to the panel as well. So, um, and I do hope you will share um, upon that um, as we go along through the questions. So we're just going to go straight into the um, into the um, conversation. So my first question, and anyone can feel free to jump in at any time, um, is what are the potential benefits of diverse event teams in terms of um, creativity and innovation? What are your thoughts? Uh, 
happy to take first stab. Um, so when posed this, something that I've been, or in, in part of what I was writing about during my master's course is just how often uh, black people or, or diverse crowds live in the imagination. And I realized growing up because of the media that I was consuming, again, born and raised in Florida in the United States, a lot of my imagine, Im imagination when I thought of myself in the future working in spaces, it was filled with white people. It was not filled with enough black people who were in my community already who I am. Um, and so I feel like in terms of diverse um, spaces and having that representation, one, at a very basic block, we need to remind people that diversity is not something that's an additive, it exists already. Mm -hmm. How are we going to reshape the landscape to mirror what's happening in real life? Um, I come from a, a large community of Haitian people who live in Florida. And when I would leave, for instance, Sundays, I, would, I grew up um, in a religious household. And so Sundays, I would go from a very black space to school the next day, and it, it was all white. Um, and having that really warped my mind in terms of what my capabilities were, in terms of what my options for a career were. Um, to be honest, when I was in high school, I, I had no idea that I would even make it to college, make it to university. And the idea of getting a master's was laughable to me. And so diversity, I think it's something that is almost step one. It's a, that, that building block for people to one, inject other communities into their imagination. So you can see people in these areas um, as though it's not an aberration. It's not abnormal. This person is not exceptional because they made it to this. So they are another human being. We have those capabilities already. We're already there. So why isn't, already, why isn't it already portrayed in these spaces? Um, and so the benefits I think are just to get people to where reality is, to sort of bridge that gap between what's in our minds and what actually can happen in reality. And just to add, I think like diversity is definitely needed. Like a lot of events aren't just like cultural events, especially it's everybody like, especially, and it's so important to have somebody who looks like you working behind that event to understand like only the small things like catering or stuff like that and what kind of food or what kind of taste we like. Um, and it's really important to, to develop that and and also have different ideas come into 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 a group i feel like sometimes especially in conferences and exhibition space there can be similar events and everyone doing the same but if you've got somebody from a different background coming in and talking about that you actually change up and add different ideas and explore different things that could happen within the within the space yeah i agree um it adds a richness um and a stronger di dimension to the offer or whatever that event is. Um, and ultimately, you know, events are created for that social aspect. We're doing it for people to bring people together. And if there is no um, diversity within the event team, then you're just getting one story or one perspective, which, to you know, automatically will exclude um, a lot of people who would be interested and want to engage and want to feel um, safe in that space, comfortable in that space. Uh, therefore, it is important to have a team that is coming with different perspectives um, and actually saying, okay, what if or this might be not the right thing to do, or actually there's a totally different way we would engage in, from a cultural context. And it's those conversations that then make that event product, that experience stronger. Thank you all for sharing that. And I completely agree. I think um, having diverse teams means that actually you get, as Dr. Pam said, you're having a different perspective. You're actually able to, you know, um, actually get different attendees as well. So if people, I think the conversation now is how do we attract different people? But I think you attract different people starting within your core team and what your core team looks like. So um, that'll be just my addition. Um, as we move on, so what are, coming off that, what are some of the unique challenges that you think that uh, black event professionals often encounter when they're starting their careers into the industry? I think um, a lot of it is doing a lot of volunteering what's not well paid or not paid at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great opportunity to be able to be at festivals and do this kind of work. But I do see that majority of 
black and brown people often might be in artist liaison or on the ground as hosting but not necessarily in the management role mm. and then with that it kind of brings um like obviously people need to people need money do you know what I mean so you can't always be working for volunteering it, it, it it's not it's not good enough basically and then also I feel like in in the in the events world a lot of people know each other and if you don't know them people it's a lot harder to get jobs especially as a freelancer or in in different rooms and I think that that's a thing that we need to break down and I think we are I think there's a lot of uh, black event professionals who are trying to do that at the moment who like 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 Nadu was doing this, who's got this company as well, but like also trying to bring other people in. Like if you've got event work, bringing other people, black and brown people in and hiring them um, as well um, is is like something to help. Sorry, I kind of counteracted my question there. <laughs> Just jumping off of that as well, I've in my experience, um, I'm very privileged and honored, but also, Essentially, my community is very much just Black women at the moment. I, funnily enough, conversely, I don't receive as many um, uh, contradicting perspectives in my social life. But in work, I found that something that we share in common, at least the, the things that I share with my community, so friends and family, is that there's an expectation for us to go above and beyond without any sort of um, recompense financially, any sort of acknowledgement in the workplace. The amount of stories I have personally from my sisters, from my friends, of just how much extra that they'll do at work, how much later they'll work at work, um, whether it had been when they were just starting their careers to now years and years in their industries, um, including the events industry, that is just unseen or just expected. And so when that level of expectation is there and the moment they drop off, so the moment they take a day or have boundaries or um, they decide that they want to ask for a raise, it is not met with the same reaction as other peers I've noticed of other races and other backgrounds. And so that underlying or that underlying expectation is something that isn't really taught. It's not talked about outside of community, I feel like. I, at least I haven't had that conversation outside of Black communities and Black circles, and I haven't seen it talked about, that underlying expectation for us to just really work ourselves to the bone in order just to get a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. um, something I've been encouraged by lately is people even younger than myself are kind of putting their foot down in ways that they can, but there's only so far we can put our foot down when we have powers and systems in place that will go right over us. And so something that black event professionals, I, I think should carry with them is that if there's an imposter syndrome that they're feeling, or if there's, um, if they're questioning, if they're doing enough, I have found that the answer is typically yes. And no matter what, you are still human. It's just, there's an expectation that's placed upon us um, that is disproportionate due to our race or due to who, how othered we are in the eyes of society. Um, and so that's something that I'm grappling with still. Dr. Pan. Yeah, um, yeah with um, picking on points from both Kasharal and, and Janine, um, one, the, events industry tends to work definitely on uh, recommendations, word of mouth. So, oh, you know, I need someone in tech. Oh, I worked with so-and-so, they're good. And if one individual's world is small um, and not so diverse, they'll keep recommending and referring those that they know and trust who then, and you don't break out of that bubble. So Katra already uh, pointed that out. And in terms of what Janine was saying, Part of, one of the other reasons around that imposter syndrome and that need to then, you know, overperform, over, you know, um, j just supply um, uh, as black events professionals then comes from that lack of trust. So where the, your face is not uh, normally seen within those spaces, uh, your the client will also then have more questions and thinking, can I trust this individual? Um, and the level of trust that would be automatically given to a white counterpart is not there. Yeah. And that can then reinforce that um, imposter syndrome because now you're having to keep um, uh, doing more over and above just to prove that you can. 
Um, so those challenges are definitely there. Um, I completely agree with that, um, especially what Dr. Pam was saying about trust. I think um, trust is a really big commodity, I think, within the industry because you're working with so many teams, so many um, suppliers, and you just want to know that people can do the job that you're paying them to do or, you know, you're hiring them to do. So I think, um, again, as a Black professional, um, it is very, very difficult, especially in the work that we've done um, with Events 101. I've realised that sometimes working with certain companies can be a lot more difficult or a lot more, um, require a lot more engagement than it would another company that I know that they, they've worked with prior because it's been a, a lot easier for them where they feel as though they don't have to communicate as much. But um, I think it comes um, as a double-edged sword where um, as Black event professionals, I think we have to build up our, um, re when I say reputability, is that the word? Like, um, being reputable and making those connections as well outside of our own bubble as well outside of the black event professionals I think also going out and making connections with people from other backgrounds to understand what they want as well because it's easy to look inward and think oh um, they're already gonna um, you know count me out because I'm a black event professional it's already going to be more difficult but I think by us actually um of being a bit more open and actually not feeling, as you said, imposter syndrome, just knowing that you are actually um, able to enter those rooms and able to speak to people. I think that will be the um, solution to um, that um, aspect of things. Um, from that as well, do you think it's essential and why do you think it's essential that Black event professionals have role models and mentors that look like them in the industry? I know um, one, for example, we have Fast Forward 15 and the founder of that, she's been working quite hard to be a bit more diverse and have different um, event professionals who are higher up um, in their careers to support the mentees that she takes on in her programme. But where there isn't as much Black event professionals at the director or CEO, or, um, you know, MD levels within events companies, do you still think it's important for um, event professionals to, or young event professionals to have mentors and role models? A hundred percent. I think it's it's I think it's vital. So when I was studying events management at Leeds Beckett University, Bernadette was my um, was my course leader. She's a, a black woman from Saint Lucia. And that made a, such a massive impact on how how where I am today, basically. I think she definitely took us aside as black students and gave us a little bit more support. Um, just because we come like nobody in our family, not well, my family has ever been to university or graduated before. So yeah. it was definitely something that I needed more extra support on. Um, and like it's always good to see somebody you can aspire to be, um, especially especially in the professional in a professional light. So for me, I never had that role model of somebody in business to look up to and be like how to present myself whilst I'm in meetings, how to go about things in a professional manner. Whereas having Bernadette and other people now, I've got like, quite a few women that I look up to, but like who have been there, who I can go to to ask questions and ask things about support and how like like. Like, and especially when you with like events is a stressful role and it can be very triggering to your mental health especially if you overwork and do too much things and you think about what everybody else is thinking it can really it can really um damage you in in certain aspects and I think like having role models somebody you can talk to somebody who's higher up who can give you advice um and help you through um difficult times is really is really fundamental to people's growth especially as youth 100 percent does anyone else have anything oh, that, yeah um being able to see you know uh there's something about actually seeing someone uh at a at a different stage sort of further ahead in their career journey that it can be really motivating and inspiring um and then you think, why not? So exactly what Kashua was saying, there's that, why not me? If if they can do it, then yes, actually, I have every right to want to do this and to have this as a dream, to want to progress. Um, and why not me? I could do it as well. And um, I think with those role models and those mentors, the opportunity to speak to them and hear their journey 
because in in hearing that the similarities there's that connection of oh yes I've had similar questions asked at me or uh, things happen to me when I've attended an event and people have made assumptions based on my appearance or I have worried that maybe I need to present my set, myself in a particular way in order for me to progress and now I'm looking um at a role model who actually chose not to conform to whatever those rigid um, sort of standards were and, you know, carved their own path. So therefore I could do it too. So there's a lot in terms of that inspiration and motivation. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, I was just gonna say a quick thing on the non-conformity because that really spoke to me. Um, that is something that I had to co consciously sort of disabuse uh, as I was going throughout education in my early career, um, just conforming and finding myself, I, I hate corporate speak so much. <laughs> I really, really do. Uh, and I, it's not to say, I, I, I try not to keep uh, things at work, of course, to a professional level, but I also getting that affirmation from role models that the way in which you are presenting yourself, the way in which you are doing things is not only enough, it's more than enough, it's creative continue going down that path, don't stop being yourself. Hearing that from a black role model is critical um, because you know that there's not nothing that's, depending on the role model, role model, of course, we are all individual people, but you know it's not, nothing's being used of you. You're not being an instrument for a, a DEI program. You're not being used in a specific way. Somebody sees you for who you are and how you can progress in the industry. And so I really like what you said about the non-conformity aspect. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there's a lack of leadership, um, no, there's a lack of diversity in leadership roles impact the experiences and career advancement of Black event professionals in the industry. I would say no, maybe controversially, but um, yeah, give your ideas. <laughs> From my perspective, I think that there's a lack of promotion of the like of the voices who are doing the work. So going back to what I said about there's an expectation for us to overwork ourselves, and that's just that's just our threshold. That's how we operate, always on level ten. Um, whereas people are love talking about boundaries and mental health days in practice. I'm not quite sure that it's as advocated for for people who reside in black uh, bodies or non-white bodies. To be fair. Um, but specifically with Black people and Black women, I find that where they are in those roles, I'm always, and maybe that's on me, I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised when I find out, oh, the, the creator of this is a Black woman. The creator of this is a Black woman. This idea came from a Black woman. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I reside in the U.S. Um, and not only in the U.S., I reside in Florida in the U.S. But I just find that there's not enough. So to your point, you're correct. We have been in spaces as long as we have been in these countries, we have been in spaces, we have been influencing thoughts, we have been shaping cultures and communities um, and in an event spaces, truly, and I, this is what I, I, I really wanna study in depth, but black culture across the diaspora has shaped how people enjoy their leisure activities, period. Um, and so we've been there, but there hasn't been enough promotion of how our influence has been there and exactly what roles we've played. Um, or acknowledgement or recompense um, for those in those roles as well. And financially, in terms of, I mean, if you look at the, pay, uh, the, the wage gaps across race, um, we know what it's like. And so um, I think that's a good point that you make that we've been in those spaces, but I, I really don't think that we've been given enough credit where credit is due. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. And I think like when you look at so to bait people out, but when you look at the major art organizations and you look at what they're programming and producing, so they're doing lots of like black art stuff and Asian and everything, it's quite inclusive. But then you actually look at the people, the event managers or the people actually doing them, they're, 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 there's not enough people of color in them groups at all. And I think, I think it's getting to that sticky stage where there's a lot of black art and black culture coming out, but who are the people who are the actual people helping to put that on sometimes it could be the idea of a black person but actually the people producing it and putting it on are not black 
mm-hmm. or not or, or none of them are black and I think that that is quite troubling to see especially in the art space when it's supposed to be all inclusive and everything like that but then when you're looking at when you're looking at the actual people who are putting these on sometimes it's not it's not reflective of what's been programmed Sorry, so with you. that um I'm gonna put the cat amongst the pigeons <laughs> and because I totally agree with you um but in terms then of there's a there's a journey to getting to leaders that leadership position mm. where you're now you now have the resources and the the space to create to own and curate all the great product um that you know you guys are talking about but within that journey something we mentioned earlier um the, when when you're starting out, before we get to leadership, when you're starting out in the industry, similar to the sort of arts industry, you know, if you don't have the bank of mom and dad or, you know, an inheritance to subsidize, you know, your 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 living expenses, it's very hard or to, you know, um, the resources to create or start your own business and all of that and all the connections. Um, and I think sometimes we lose so it's just that at that leadership stage level people have sort of dropped by the wayside they're burnt mm-hmm. out it's just been too much um they faced so many obstacles that they couldn't hold out to get to the leadership position so i think sometimes there is that and never mind as well uh where because you know when i speak to my students about this they'll go, we still get the questions from our family. As in, is this really the career in terms of, is it safe, an economically safe choice? Uh, so if those questions keep coming at you, some, sometimes it's hard to stick it out to get to a leadership position. Okay, I'm going to quickly move on to our individual questions. Um, so this question is for Keshara. In your experience within the industry, what changes have you witnessed over the years in terms of diversity and representation in the events industry and what challenges remain? So for me, the changes that I've seen, I've seen a lot of us actually putting in on our own events. So like Storms is doing amazing events all across the world. We've got Afro Nation, they're doing their own kind of events. So there's a lot of people coming together and putting on the events that they want to see happen in the world, which is amazing and uh, and it's great. I think the challenges that are still seen is again, like I, like I said previously, is is leadership, um, um, people in higher, higher positions and also, um yeah like like we've said before like work it like people working a lot and I think um going above and beyond and I think the challenges are also financially like especially as a woman as well I think it's really hard in the events industry after a certain age especially if you want to have kids or something because of the like unsociable hours and the way that you're working it is it is quite a challenge to balance that and have that life work life work balance um, especially as 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 a woman, especially if you want to bear children as well. Okay, thank you. Um, to the audience, if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to utilize the chat, and then we will answer your questions towards the end. Um, for Dr. Pam, so what role do you think um academia can play in fostering change within the events industry to ensure greater representation for Black event event professionals? And I like this question because I know myself. I've worked quite closely with Amy. Um, so um, how do you feel like um academia can help? Um, I think three ways. Uh, one in in the way we educate. Um, so looking at the degree programs we're offering, the curriculum, um, because in those spaces we have future event professionals. Uh, typically on a a course. So like at University of Greenwich, we maybe have me about on average five black students each year. Um, so it's it's a it's a small group, uh, but where you have a room of future event professionals talking about diversity, equality, inclusion, 
um, as part of the curriculum gets everyone focused. Um, and that's something, for example, we do that at Greenwich um, with an event policy module that we teach. And uh, so right now, actually, uh, as in this morning, our students were looking at that. And I, I think um, I shared, you know, in terms of this panel that these discussions are so important for our students. So there's uh, that educating. And um, within academia, uh, challenging how we're creating knowledge. So I loved how Keshra uh, said one of the reasons why she uh, got into the events industry was because her mom organized raves. So within the events industry, um, as part of a knowledge area, it's new. It's not like the classical subjects. And a lot of that knowledge is coming from the events professionals industry, which traditionally in academia is not sometimes recognized as true knowledge, that tacit learning, practical learning. And therefore, um, uh, you know, Keshara's mom has the lived experience, is an expert. Right. And she's been organizing these events. And I think in academia, if we now recognize all these, because um, there is a community of black events professionals organizing events, uh, but maybe not in that formal sort of theoretical perspective, but that is knowledge and that needs to be incorporated in academia in the curriculum. Then thirdly, in terms of research. So we are out there, we're doing the research and um, the critical theories that we use, um, uh, you know, I look at, um, uh, I apply that critical theory to the way I conduct research into what's going on in the events industry. Um, those theories allow us to not only identify where there are inequalities or the system, the frameworks that need to be challenged, but uh, what they also very importantly do is encourage us as academics to now co-create with people in those sectors to find solutions. So that solution finding within academia. So presenting the findings of these are sort of areas where we need to improve, grow, and these are the solutions um, that we can provide. So I think those are, are key ways in terms of academia, um, how we can do that. We're doing a lot as well. Um, I think you mentioned placements. So that uh, where we facilitate, because one of the other things that was mentioned is a lot of students will not, and Black students won't have the connections to say, you know, uncle, uncle, you know, Dom, can you organize a, an internship with me, for me, you know, at Live Nation, whatever. But if we as universities are facilitating that and preparing our students to enter those spaces, then we are, are really doing something great. Thank you so much. So for Janine, how can you collaborate with industry professionals and organizations to provide students with networking and membership opportunities that promote diversity and representation? I think you have to put yourself out there to an extent, but in a way that's authentic to yourself. Um, so like, like an ongoing thread we had talked about um, in terms of having that representation there and having those allies there, essentially black allies in your community to sort of help guide you. Um, you also should, in your own way, in the way that you want to present yourself to the world, reach out to those folks um, and start building those connections. And so I also loved uh, Kesharel's, um story about how her mom planned those raves because in my master's dissertation, I was writing about music festivals typically and how white supremacy influenced how music festivals in the US are shaped today. Mm -hmm. And in that, I, need, I needed to do a lot of research. Um, one, understanding the perspectives of black US citizens who attended music festivals and what those experiences were. Because I had my suspicions because of stories. A lot of storytelling happens in black communities and a lot of stories are unrecorded. Um, but those stories are critical knowledge. And I use critical race theory as my sort of framework as well. Um, but the, the connections that I made within my community, those from friends and family, from their friends and their family, those were viable subjects to interview. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of going back to your question, it's, it's connections like those that we do need to lead upon, um, community members that we have knowledge, of, even if you think it's a small connection, even if it's just, okay, maybe I met this person, um, just in passing, but I really like the work that they're doing, or I really resonate with the ideas that they have, or I would really like a job at their organization, meeting them on their level and maybe asking them to coffee, maybe reaching out to them on LinkedIn. Now, those are very standard sort of pathways as well. 
And so I would say like going back to the authenticity as well, coming to the table with something to offer these folks and leaning on your community members and exactly what your ask is. Um, joining clubs, of course, joining clubs and organizations like this one um, in order to get your name out there. Being honest as well, I, I think that's something that's really important and that's easy for Black professionals across industries is just to lose yourself in what um, corporate standard is. I, I'm, I'm in a very corporate world right now, so I talk about corporate a lot, but um, what corporate standard is and what that looks like, and that's been defined by white men and no shade. I do not want to emulate white men in my future. And so I need to lean on community in order to continue entering spaces in an authentic way, in a clumsy way, in a, in a oh, I'm gonna make mistakes kind of way, but I feel safe and I can still progress and I can still reach my goals and I can still um, achieve the things that I want to academically, financially, professionally um, by using these connections um, in my authentic self. So um, sorry, going back to your, <laughs> going back to your question, um, I would say, yeah, just putting yourself out there in a way that feels best to you, in a way that feels safest to you, and trusting your instincts on that as well. Um, I think there's a certain set of instincts that you develop that's just been gained over observation over time as a Black person um, as to who's in your corner and who's not. And so relying on those as well. And it's unfortunate that we have to have to develop that sort of skill, um, but that's the reality for a lot of us wanting to achieve our goals and also um, stay true to ourselves. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just briefly going to share. Um, so they asked that, despite the gap in fair representation, um, are there any success stories that I have seen or um, personally contributed to, to the advancement of Black event professionals? And I think since starting um, Events 101 in 2020, um, I think just being visible, firstly, has encouraged a lot of young um, Black event professionals to actually push in their careers because a lot of them especially from Greenwich <laughs> I tend to speak to them um, through LinkedIn um, and I see how then they've now chosen to actually go a different route maybe some people just want to do you know music festivals and things like that but then they now start to realize that oh there's the corporate events world there's you know weddings there's other things that I can actually do um, which will also give me first of all better money and then secondly also um the career that I would like to achieve within the events industry so um I can use one of the young ladies that I work with quite closely um as a case study and um she always wants to get an event I think we've been speaking for a couple of years now and um she would always say I don't know how to get into events I don't know what I want to do in events so what I did was kind of have her around um, working with us at different events from award shows to fashion shows to um, things that I was doing in collaboration with um, Steven and things like that so um, this time around I just see that she went out of her way to speak to people at Steven and actually she did that on her own and she actually had the confidence to actually um, make connections and network with people outside of what we had going on and for me that's um, a testament to the work that we've done because I think if we didn't create that platform, she wouldn't have been able to find a way to, you know, gain the confidence, have the boldness to speak to people in senior positions um, within the industry and also branch out to exploring other um, aspects of the events industry. So um, that's one of the success stories. And I think as we continue to go through Events 101 and more people join, because um, a lot of our people are national, international um, students as well. So giving them those opportunities are second to none because like Dr. Pam mentioned, some people don't have the backing of mom and dad. So, or they don't have a family member who works in the industry. So if um, we don't make those connections within the industry as a gateway for them, I don't think a lot of people of our background would actually even think, oh, I can do this. So um, yeah, that's my success story. Um, my last question would be, are there any resources or tools that Black event professionals can use to navigate their careers and overcome barriers that they may face? Um, yeah, I think obviously being having a social presence on LinkedIn is very helpful. Like I said, going to places where they offer programs to get into events. So like lots of festivals. I know like We Out Here Festival, we have a program where we're like, let individuals young individuals come into festivals also connecting with people going to networking events going to 
following what's actually happening in the event industry now, like obviously with AI, there's so much tech things that are happening. Like I'm, I'm so confused, I'm baffled about how much tech's going into events at the moment, but also just keeping up to on modern trends and looking into that as well. But also scoping out not just what's happening at events in the UK, but also internationally, especially looking at what's happening in the festival world in America, because they do stuff a lot different to how we do that as well, and how we can incorporate their ideas into into our own practices as well. Um, and that's, that's, that's a bit it, really, for me. <laughs> okay. I'd say going to also events for fun. That's, I mean, just attending as many events, that's great research. It's great inspiration. It's a way to get your observations and yeah, I, I would just say attending events in general. And then um, like Keisha Rell was mentioning, there are a lot of festivals, because I also understand the student struggle as well. Um, so volunteering at some of these festivals, if you have the time, because of course time is a precious resource that you know is not afforded to everyone. And so if you have the time, volunteering at these events uh, in their volunteer programs is a great way to one, make connections, but then get experience that you can put down on paper and then also get your inspiration from um, like I said, in undergrad, that's kind of what I was doing on the side until it became my sort of student job and then it became my real job. Um, I don't think I'm gonna touch public relations in this lifetime because events is kind of where my interests lie. And so doing that, I think is just a good resource in general. And there's plenty of free events, especially in the UK. That's what I loved about it. You guys really do take advantage of your park spaces and your open air nature spaces to have festivals and community gatherings and that. And so going to those, I think is a great way to just ensure that you're always up on those trends like Keisha was talking about. And let me just add also, do your own events and it doesn't have to be big events, like small events, doing vision boards with friends, getting organized, something at the park, doing a sound system in the house or something, like just getting that experience of doing something small and learning the different processes of running events is always a good thing. And that is also gives you experience to deal with things um, outside, like when you get a job as well. So like I, I definitely, 100% do your own events as well and grassroots events like community events and all about that life as well. Um, you um, pretty much mentioned most things and just to add to that um, from a student perspective um, any prospective students there was the rich scholarship um, that would support uh, uh, black students wanting to study events management um, so uh, you know, pursuing those options as well are really good to help. Um, and we mentioned Fast um, Board 15. Uh, also, the power of events are doing quite a bit. Um, their campaign has been has really started and is getting strong. So the more prof events professionals we get from um, all different contexts on that app, then we get a true representation of what actually is going on. Um, and I think a uh, final one I would want to cheekily suggest, it's not a resource, but a reverse resource or reverse mentoring as in when you're attending those or joining um, a membership of an association, uh, attending events, um, or, you know, take the courage to ask or to give the feedback. If there's something missing in the programming, um, then step forward because uh, sometimes that's what it needs. It needs sort of us to then actually, as we are attending, as we're joining and taking part, that's how those spaces start to change. And we kind of, they need to go, oh, you know, by the way, w could we have this, this and this? And then that starts to change, you know, we kind of do that um, um, the tipping point, get, get the industry to that tipping point. Thank you all so much. I'll do my drop, my resource. Um, so one, I'll be releasing a book next year, well, early 2024. So that's a resource that I would say will be very helpful for every um, professional, every young Black event professional, I guess, to help them navigate through um, the industry. Um, another one I would agree with Janine as attending events. I used to just go to some of the events are no longer held, but things like Squarespace um, meetings and events live. I would go to event tech live. Um, there's another one for fashion called Pure. Just going to these large events. There's a lot of them. Some of them are not free anymore, but they used to be. Um, but on November, I would literally just type in events for event professionals 
and whatever came up, I went. So um, putting yourself out there, networking as much as you can, um, and also doing your doing your research and understanding what's actually needed within the industry now is quite key because um, as a young black event professional, you can go in there thinking, oh, I've called an event before, I know what I'm doing. But actually in the real world, in especially if you want to get into corporate events, you know nothing. Um, and being open to learn um, the new things that are coming from your leadership within work or um, within your business or within just the industry in general, because there are people who have actually gone before you who know how to do um, things so quick. So even right now, I'm reading a couple books. Ooh, read books from event professionals as well. So my main, right now I'm reading um, one from Colin Cowie. He's an American. Um, there's another one from a lady from Google that she released. Um, I need to find a name. And maybe I'll post it on my Instagram because I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. But read books from other event professionals and learn how they do things, how they relate with people as well. Because people management is heavily a part of events. And I think that's a bit that as black event professionals, sometimes we can even miss because we just kind of miss it. It's just that detail. So, um, yeah, I'm seeing, okay, the questions. Let me just go down. Yeah, I love Colin right now. I'm enjoying him. His book is so good. It's called The Gold Standard. That's my favorite book right now. Um, so I'm going to go with what role do you think the UK government can have to support greater diversity in the workplace? Um, does anyone want to chime in on that? I think the UK government could do with, I know we still... <clears throat> We've got certain funds where people can create and do their own, like arts council, they can do their own events. But I definitely feel like it needs to be more. Um, and um, I think especially and and permissions and getting permissions of doing your own 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 events. I think the government could do a lot more help with helping people how to apply for applications in, in place, certain places or anything like that around events. I think it's very, like if you don't have the knowledge of mm. doing that kind of thing, it's very hard for somebody new to come in to do that without that without that acknowledgement. Okay. Um... Yeah, I just wanted to point out, I agree with that. Um, I think, unfortunately, well, in this country, definitely money follows money. So funding having worked with, you know, Arts Council funded uh, or funded uh, uh, organizations in the past, y you are rated based on how much funding you got previously. So it's hard for, um, you know, um, grassroots companies trying to break into a sector. But I think also there's a, you know, the, the funding and support disappears for organizations uh, professionals that are trying to move to from either the the small to medium that in between stage so there's support for the sort of larger ones because they're bringing in money for government and uh, maybe some specific ones but I think just level sort of support that is forgiving as well and without the big expectations that people must return in 12 months show you know a profit and um all these great results, but sort of uh, more sympathetic support and resources that is long term. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Keisha Rao. And thank you, Dr. Pam, for joining this panel today. And thank you to all the audience who engaged with us, who listened to the conversation. I'm just going to pass it back to Naidu um, and she'll close with us. Today. Well, also thank you to you, Benedicta, I think, to close off on that. Um, I hope everyone really enjoyed. John, thank you for having us. Um, obviously, this will be up on your website and we'll also be able to share. And if anyone wants to reach out to us with any queries, you can get in touch. I'll put our email in the chat, info at theabp.org, um, and we can connect you with all of our speakers as well. I'll make sure, John, you have everyone's info to put on that link and um, have a great rest of the day everyone thank you everybody yeah thanks all as you say Nadu will put that up onto the live website I don't think I've ever scribbled quite so many notes <laughs> as I did today that was brilliantly informative and really feeds into a lot of things we're trying to achieve through the live workforce group in particular I don't know if you know Adam Holness at the South Bank Centre but I was I was meeting with him. He's head of contemporary music there, and he was saying when he looks across London, 
there's nobody that looks like him. Where's where's his contemporary to talk to? So some yes. of the messaging you had about the lack of diversity and leadership really rang true. We've benefited from reverse mentoring as well. Uh, we have our live awards each year. Um, it was very successful. But one thing we realized last year was it was too many white men speaking from the platform. So we've taken that message well and truly on board. And we're looking to how we strengthen that event um, in this coming December. So um, I've got lots of actions to take away. I will be in touch with all of you. Hopefully uh, we can put you in touch with Latonia as well, who asked the huge question of are black women changing the events industry, which you would probably need a day and a half to answer. But <laughs> um, we'll put her in touch with you um, and then hopefully you can pick up with that offline. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, Lakida, for teaching me the word lobs deliciously. <laughs> Thanks all. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.